Hi guys, it's Professor Costa and I'm back with Advanced Oxygenation and Perfusion, Adult Code Part 3. All right, so um, in our prior video, we had our um, cardiac arrest algorithm, our full ACLS where we're shocking and delivering medications. And now what? What do we do if we actually bring this client back? Which, believe it or not, does happen. So we have return of spontaneous circulation, also known as ROSC. All right, we want to optimize ventilation and oxygenation, right? So we want to make sure that this patient has, if they need one, they have an advanced airway, that we maintain oxygen saturations of greater than 94%. That's the number the American Heart Association likes, so who am I to argue with them? And we don't want to hyperventilate, right? We want to treat hypotension. So oftentimes these patients come out of a code, remember they had cardiac arrest. So the central pump in their body stopped working and they basically died. And we had to bring them back and do compressions. So they may have issues with cardiac output for some reason. So if their systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeters of mercury, we're gonna fluff them up a little bit. We need to give them an IV bolus. And if you look on the right, you'll see under IV bolus, approximately one to two liters of normal saline or lactated ringers. And that can be delivered IV or IO, okay? Um, vasopressor infusion. So the three vasopressors on the right are not new to you, epinephrine, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And that would be prescribed by the provider. So the first two, epinephrine and dopamine, remember, not only do those increase um, blood pressure, but they also increase heart rate. So depending on the, the clinical scenario, they may be chosen because, for instance, if the patient is hypotensive and bradycardic, then they may choose epinephrine or dopamine. If your patient is um, hypotensive and tachycardic, then that's when they would choose norepinephrine because basically it has more of an, an effect on blood pressure than it does on heart rate. It really doesn't touch the heart rate that much. And we also want to consider treatable causes. So was this caused by acute coronary syndrome? Do we have, you know, a plaque rupture in one of the coronary arteries? Is this from a massive pulmonary embolism? So whatever the, the cause is, we want to figure that out and treat it. So to check and make sure it isn't, you know, a likely suspect, which is acute coronary syndrome, we would do a 12 lead ECG. So if that patient has a STEMI, an ST elevation MI, or a high suspicion of an acute MI, we would send them to the cath lab. So the goal here would be coronary reperfusion, right? And once they've completed coronary reperfusion, then we have to decide a few things. So how well did we perfuse their brain with our compressions, right? Are they able to follow commands, wake up and follow commands? you know, squeeze, squeeze my hand, open your eyes, then if they're unable, so no matter what, they're unable to follow commands, we need to do some brain protection. And that's when we would initiate targeted temperature management. We actually cool them off a bit. And this stems from uh, years of study, but also I, I know you've all heard these stories about um, little kids following under the ice and drowning under the water for like 20 minutes and you know they went ice skating or something and then we're able to pull them out and resuscitate them and they have normal brain function which doesn't make sense if you've drowned and um, deprived your body of oxygen for 20 minutes there's no way that you should be able to come out of it and what they found is that there's some divers response in here um, where everything slows down from the cold and it offers some protection to the brain so we're gonna steal a little bit of that. And if they're unable to follow commands, we're gonna take you to the ICU and we're gonna cool you off. So uh, we're not dunking you in ice water. It's done very, very, very carefully. And we're slowly going to lower your core temperature down to the low 90s. And then we're going to paralyze and sedate you and keep you asleep for a day and then slowly warm you back up. And that has been shown in studies to improve brain function following um, uh, a, a code like that. If they're able to follow commands, then we have good brain function, so we don't need to cool you off. And we're, but you'll also go to the ICU, okay? So I want you to remember on the right-hand side all of the doses and details, okay? So for our ventilation and oxygenation, we do want to avoid excessive ventilation. And we want to titrate 
for a target end tidal CO2 of 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. That's if we have the ability to do end tidal CO2 monitoring, right? And we also want to titrate the FiO2 to um, achieve an SpO2 of at least 94%, right? So we want a, a good SpO2. Um, we want to make sure that they're oxygenated. We want to give them IV fluids to prevent or treat hypotension. So if they're hypotensive, so if their systolic blood pressure is less than 90, they're going to get IV fluid, okay? And then, again, we're going to try and treat the cause. So was it hypovolemia? Do they need blood transfusions? Um, is there potassium in the toilet? Uh, who knows? So one of the treatable H's and T's. So this isn't a, an unfamiliar slide. It's adult tachycardia with a pulse. You saw this in 1063. So we're going to assess for the appropriateness of the clinical condition, right? So American Heart Association um, defines this as a um, heart rate of greater than 150, right? And we know tachycardia, like if you're climbing a flight of stairs, that's expected. So that's why we're going to assess for appropriateness of the clinical condition. I'm going to tell you right now, tachycardia at rest is always bad. And American Heart says that if you have a patient who's tachycardic at rest with a heart rate of greater than 150, we're going to call that a tachyarrhythmia. All right, we're not going to call it sinus tach. We're going to call it a tachyarrhythmia. And we want to treat and identify the underlying cause. We want to maintain a patent airway. So our ABCs are really important here, right? So Assist breathing is necessary, literally ABC. If they're hy hypoxic, we want to give them oxygen. We want to put them on a cardiac monitor, try to identify their rhythm, and we want to make sure we're monitoring blood pressure and pulse oximetry. All right, so here's where we're going to ask ourselves some questions. Is this tachyarrhythmia causing symptoms? Do we have an issue here, right? So do I have to hurry? <laughs> So do we have hypotension or a change in mental status, signs of shock, chest pain, or acute heart failure, something like crackles in the lungs? If this is getting really bad really quickly, we need to intervene now. So if you answer those questions, yes, then the first step may be synchronized cardioversion. I'm, I'm telling you, this is the American Heart Association's recommendation. In real life, does it always happen this way? No, but for testing purposes, yes, it does. So we would want to intervene as soon as possible. So synchronized cardioversion, it says consider sedation. Um, if you are a human being and have any feelings at all, you will absolutely advocate for your client to have some kind of sedative. It is a painful procedure. And if it's, if it's a narrow complex, so if it's an SVT, that's what it's saying here. If it's a narrow complex, they would consider adenosine. So I'm going to tell you, honestly, in real life, before we start electrocuting people or sending an electrical pulse through their heart, usually if it's a narrow complex SVT, we would start with adenosine. But we're going to follow the American Heart Association guidelines. And remember, these are guidelines. So we just have to know what they recommend. Who's really going to make this decision? it's usually a cardiologist or an emergency room physician. So they're gonna have some experience on their side to decide which one they wanna do, okay? If the answer is no, if it's not causing any like emergent, like have to fix it right, right, right now, and it's not causing any of those things like change in mental status or hypotension, and it has a wide QRS, meaning we measured the QRS and it's greater than three small boxes. Again, we would give I, we would do IV axis, a 12 lead EKG, maybe adenosine, but we may also, what they're suspecting if it's a wide QRS is it could be VTAC, ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. Sometimes that happens. So they may consider an antiarrhythmic infusion like amiodarone, all right? We're going to keep going down. So we don't have any bad signs and we don't have a wide QRS. Then we have a little time to breathe here. We want the IV access and a 12 lead EKG. We would try with the least invasive measures first, and that's the vagal maneuver. So we would have the patient bear down like they were going to have a bowel movement. Sometimes we try to elicit that diver's reflex 
and put ice um, on the patient's nose, things like that. The only person who would do a carotid massage, and it's not exactly something that we like doing because if they have plaque, yeah, uh, uh, but a physician would do carotid massage. Nurses don't do that, okay? Adenosine would be a good medication if the um, tachycardia is a narrow complex and it's, you know, regular. So it's not an AFib. That's why it's saying if regular. We wouldn't give adenosine to a rapid AFib. We would give a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, okay? And that's why that's also included on the algorithm. And consider expert consultation. Oh, yeah, oh, I have a tachyarrhythmia. I want a cardiologist here, right? So let's look down the right-hand side. If we have to do synchronized cardioversion, like the patient's really not doing well and they've decided that initially they're going to do that, we're going to use less joules than we do for someone who's arrested. So... It, if they have a narrow regular, like an SVT, um, we would do 50 to 100 joules. A narrow irregular for like a rapid AFib would be 120 to 200 biphasic or 200 monophasic. A wide regular, 100 joules. So that would be a, a wide regular would be a VTAC, a conscious person with VTAC who has a pulse. And a wide irregular um, they get the defibrillation dose, not synchronized, okay? So adenosine, we know the first dose of adenosine is six milligrams rapid IV push, followed with a normal saline flush, and the second dose is 12 milligrams, okay? Remember, the half-life of adenosine is like, whoop, it's gone. So you have to um, administer that as high up on the chain, so to speak. You don't want to put that in the wrist, so to speak. Mm. So if you have a central line, um, I know it's not written here, but it is in your book, that you would um, cut the dose in half. <clears throat> and then the second dose is 12 milligrams. So if we need an antiarrhythmic, so if we have a conscious VTAC, someone with a pulse, we may choose to do an um, antiarrhythmic like amiodarone or procainamide or sotalol. All right, and that's what that's here for on the algorithm. And you may see math on your exam. Well, I don't know if a lot of these medications are milligrams per minute or um, administered. Sotalol is 1.5 milligrams per kilogram over five minutes. You would need to know what the uh, dose is for a certain weight. All right, I haven't written those questions yet, but typically that's what I like to put on those um, exams. All right, so adult bradycardia with a pulse. Not new, we've seen this one. So again, we want to assess for the appropriateness of the clinical condition. There are some really fit people walking around with resting heart rates in the 40s. You know, marathon runners, people who, you know, competitively swim in the Olympics or so forth. And they're in no distress, right? You know, a little 90-year-old Maymay who has a heart rate less than 50 may feel it. So we're going to check. So typically, it's considered a bradyarrhythmia if the heart rate's less than 40 and the patient is symptomatic. So we want to identify and treat the underlying cause. Same thing here. ABCs. We want to maintain a patent airway, give them oxygen if they need it, put them on a cardiac monitor, get an IV, and a 12 lead EKG. So here's our pink box. So is this persistent bradyarrhythmia causing hypotension, change in mental status, signs of shock, ischemic chest discomfort, meaning chest pain, or acute heart failure? And if the answer is no, then we watch, right? So we'll watch and see what's going on. If they are having signs of hypotension, signs of shock, etc., that's when we choose to give them atropine. Right, so in the dose of atropine is pretty set at 0.5 milligrams, and then we can repeat that every three to five minutes for a maximum dose of three milligrams. If the dose of atropine is not effective, we can do transcutaneous pacing where we stick the electrodes on the front and back of the chest, and we use the defibrillator machine for a little while to pace them, or we can give them dopamine or epinephrine, and those 
are not new. So dopamine and epinephrine increase heart rate, and those are the doses on the side, 2 to 20 mics per kilogram per minute for dopamine, 2 to 10 mics per um, minute infusion for epinephrine, all right? And we also want to consider expert um, consultation. And remember, the transcutaneous pacing is really just a temporary Band-Aid. It hurts. Um, this is when, if it's persistent and the medications aren't doing what we need them to do, we would have a central line placed and they would get transvenous pacing, which is a lot more comfortable for the client. And if they can't figure out what it is, it's going to turn into a chronic issue. That's when the cardiologist may decide to place a permanent pacemaker. But we don't know what's going on with the patient yet, right? So the patient would go and be admitted and watched on a cardiac monitor and regulated on medications on a transvenous pace. So acute coronary syndrome, all right? You've had acute coronary syndrome in 2040. So symptoms suggestive of ischemia or infarction, right? So we have someone who's complaining of chest pain or maybe jaw pain or arm pain. They're sweaty. Um, they may have GI issues. Um, in fact, many diabetics only report the GI issues. So whatever the signs and symptoms suggestive of ischemia or infarction, we're going to get that person to a medical center as soon as possible. So EMS assessment and care and hospital prep. So they're going to monitor and support the ABCs, right? And these people can go into a lethal arrhythmia very quickly. You have a section of heart that's not being perfused, and that heart can get very angry and stop working. So they're going to be prepared to uh, administer CPR and DFib. So they're going to get a dose of aspirin. And remember that this is the adult 325, and they're going to have that patient chew it, right? And they would also consider oxygen, nitroglycerin, and morphine if needed, right? So the, the thing that's actually, I like to explain this to my, my students, and I love to use the I-95. I know, I apologize. So we have um, a patient, um, patient presenting with signs of chest pain. What's going on in their heart, right? So we have a blocked lane, right? Or a blocked section of I-95, okay? So we're trying to open up I-95 enough so that we can actually um, perfuse or send some cars through or however you wanna talk about it. So we have a complete road closure or we have a partial road closure and we have a risk for a uh, complete road closure because when you have a huge accident on the highway, we can have more and more cars pile on and that's what the aspirin is for. So we have plaque rupture and we have um, clots forming and we have platelets coming to the party and we want to turn those platelets away. We want to say, nope, you can't come to our party. So we administered the 325 of aspirin and we want it to be absorbed as quickly as possible. So we have them chew it and they start absorbing it right in their mouth. Okay. The oxygen is to support our heart, which has, you know, lost its ability to get oxygen because the highway is closed. The nitroglycerin may help us open a lane up, right? So the nitro would help open up an additional lane and help the problem. And morphine, you know, one, this is often very painful. And when people are in pain, it increases the stress response, which makes their oxygen demand go up. So if we give them morphine, it helps them to relax. It also helps, you know, calm everything down and may actually reduce oxygen demand by the heart. So we like morphine for that. But the morphine isn't going to fix the problem, right? The thing that's going to fix this problem, if we have an acute coronary syndrome, is reperfusion therapy. M let me repeat myself. All those meds that we just talked about are to get the person to the hospital and keep them alive long enough so we can get them to reperfusion therapy. All right. So the aspirin prevents the accident from getting any worse. The nitroglycerin may help us open a lane so some cars get by. The oxygen is going to help support the heart while it's in distress, and the morphine is going to keep the situation calm. All right? You definitely want to keep the accident from getting bigger, so you want to give them that aspirin right away. So we want to get a 12-lead EKG, and if they have an ST elevation, then we need to notify the hospital that we're coming with a STEMI um, so that they can get the cath lab right, ready, right? 
and they're going to get every all the hospital resources ready for that patient okay sometimes we have places where they have a long trip we're, we're in a, a good spot in providence or, or within the state of rhode island because anywhere you could throw a rock and hit a, a hospital around here there are places in the country that are very remote and I don't even mean like Alaska. I mean parts of the Midwest where it's hours before you get to a, a, a hospital. So in some places, they actually would consider pre-hospital fibrinolysis. So they may use a medication like streptokinase and they would have to follow a fibrinolytic checklist, right? So believe it or not, we're, we're a very lucky spot. We have hospitals all around us, but in many places they have to consider giving them something in, in an IV to help remove the clot to, to for reperfusion therapy using medications instead of a catheter, okay? So they get to the emergency room. This is that concurrent ED assessment. We're doing these things kind of all at the same time. That's why it says concurrent. We're checking vital signs. We're getting an IV. We're going to get a brief history. We're going to review, complete the fibrinolytic uh, checklist and check for contraindications, right? Because um, some patients still are treated with things like streptokinase. We want to obtain initial cardiac markers and electrolytes and coag studies, and we want a portable chest x-ray. Why do we want a portable chest x-ray? We want to rule out things like aortic dissection. Remember, aortic dissection can look kind of familiar, and it looks like an MI, and it, we don't want to give that patient a fibrinolytic if they're actually having an aortic dissection. We want to get that person to the operating room. And then we want to do general treatment, O2. If they haven't had their aspirin or nitroglycerin, this is when we're going to give it, right? And a morphine for discomfort if the nitroglycerin doesn't get rid of the chest pain. ECG interpretation. That's a doctor, okay? So the cardiologist is going to do that. and But we do need to be prepared to understand what our patient may be going to. We need to anticipate. So an ST elevation or a new or presumably new left bundle branch block, they're going to go for reperfusion therapy, right? If they have a ST depression or dynamic T wave inversion, susp suspicious for ischemia, we're going to call that a, a non-STEMI, um, and their troponin's really high, you know, that they may go for reperfusion therapy then, all right? Um, if they have a normal, uh, normal or non-diagnostic changes in their ST, look, so they have a normal EKG and a low risk for acute coronary syndrome, like a 16-year-old who just ate 15 hot dogs comes in complaining of chest pain, chances are it's a tummy problem and not an MI. Then we would just administer, you know, admit them to the chest pain unit for a little while and give them some Mylanta. So if a patient is having a non-STEMI and they're high risk for non-ST elevation, uh, acute coronary syndrome, Again, this is, this is that gray area in the middle. So if they're a really high risk patient, they may actually go to the cath lab or they may get admitted to the unit and be treated with um, nitroglycerin and heparin, okay? If it's, um, you know, if we have a STEMI and it's been greater than 12 hours, that person may also go to the, the unit and be started on heparin therapy. If it's been less than 12 hours, then they're going to go to the cath lab or they're going to get a needle of fibrinolysis, okay? So if we have a patient with a STEMI and it's been less than 12 hours, they're going to go to the cath lab hopefully within 90 minutes or we can get a fibrinolysis me medication um, administered within 30 minutes, all right? So... If we have a non-STEMI with a high risk for acute coronary syndrome, we're going to check and see how well they're doing. And if it's, you know, in some places, it says according to uh, American Heart Association that we would simply monitor them and treat them with heparin and nitroglycerin. In some cases, if the, the risk is very, very high, they may still bring that patient to the cath lab. But according to American Heart Association, what we would do is start adjunctive therapies, okay? 
if it's a normal EKG and they're at low risk, again, we're going to watch them because they're complaining of chest pain, but it may be another cause and we're going to work them up for that. So part of this, um, because it is a DEL code, you may have an unresponsive patient and or um, a suspected stroke, right? So we want to identify the signs and symptoms of possible stroke. Stroke isn't new. You had this a while ago. But now we're going to talk about the, the patient who has experienced an acute stroke is getting treated, and then what do we do now, right? So obviously we want to mark the time. Right? We want to support the ABCs, make sure that we're performing a pre-hospital stroke assessment. We want to monitor um, you know, their glucose, so because oftentimes a, uh, a suspected stroke turns out to be hypoglycemia. We want to stabilize the, the patient, ABCs, vital signs, oxygen. Okay, We want to get them to a place, um, a hospital, that has the ability to do an emergency T or MRI, right? We really want that CT scan um, because we want to see is it a hemorrhagic stroke or it, does the MRI or CT look normal? And, and in an ischemic stroke, the MRI often, uh, I'm sorry, the CT looks normal. In a hemorrhagic stroke, you're going to see bleeding in the brain, right? So we're going to rule out a bleed. And then the physician or the, the designee is going to do a patient history. When was the last known normal? That's a really important time to know. When were they last seen being themselves? And they're going to perform a neurologic examination, the NIH stroke scale or the Canadian neurologic scale, and they want to see if they have any deficits. Does the CAT scan show a hemorrhage? So if there's a hemorrhage, then they're going to need a neurosurgeon and a neurologist. They can't have, um, they can't have um, TPA if they're having a bleed. If there's no hemorrhage, then probable acute ischemic stroke, they're going to consider fibrinolytic therapy like TPA, right? Um, and in the, um, the newer guidelines, which we're going to go over in the, uh, another lecture, but in the, in the newer guidelines, in addition to TPA, we would also bring them to the cath lab and do a catheterization. We're able to do that now. All right, so when these recommendations came out five years ago, they weren't even doing that yet. Now they are. So, um, but we want to review the risks and benefits with the patient and family. Remember, so TPA, even though when it works, it works really well, does come with inherent risks, and we can cause a way worse problem sometimes. So if the patient and family is okay with the risk, then they're going to get the TPA. And we would not give them any additional anticoagulants or antiplatement treatment for 24 hours. All right. Okay. So um, we would. There's a really, really rigid post TPA stroke pathway where you have to follow all these things, um, all these checklists for day one, day two, day three, day four. And we're going to aggressively monitor their blood pressure, their um, their neuro status, um, their bleeding status. Um, and of course, they're going to get administered. Uh, sorry, ad admitted to the stroke unit. So that's why you want them to go to a stroke center, like Rhode Island Hospital has a wonderful uh, unit and f uh, staff that are trained to deal with patients um, suffering from an acute stroke. So here's an unfortunate slide, and I got to tell you, in the last two years, I've given um, Narcan twice at CCRI. And I don't even like to think about it, but I've had two situations. So I do have Narcan in my office now in Warwick because of that. So if we have an opioid associated, associated life-threatening emergency, um, we want to assess and activate, right? So if we have an unresponsive client, um, just like anybody else, we're not, we don't know unless they have like a needle sticking out of their arm with, you know, heroin written on it. We're not going to know that it's an opiate overdose right away. So we're going to call and activate the chain of command and chain of survival and ask for help. We're going to send uh, someone to call 911 and get the AED. And if we have naloxone, we're going to get the naloxone. We're going to observe for breathing versus no breathing or only gasping. So we want to begin CPR. So if the patient is unresponsive with no breathing or only gasping, um, we want to do rescue breathing, right? So. And if we're alone, we're going to perform CPR for about two minutes before leaving to phone 911 
and get naloxone and an AED. All right, we want to administer the naloxone. So it's 2 milligrams intranasally or 0.4 milligrams intramuscular. And we can repeat that after four minutes. Does the person respond? So now here's the thing with naloxone. If it's not an opiate overdose, who cares? Big whoop. That's not, you know, it's not going to do anything. And if it works, the person should wake up and respond. So if the any time the per person does move purposefully, breathe regularly, moan, or otherwise respond, then we're going to stimulate them. So that's when we would do that sternal rub, and we're going to check responsiveness and breathing until advanced help arrives. If they stop responding, then we're going to start doing CPR and repeat the naloxone. We're going to continue rescue breathing and or CPR and use the AED as soon as it is available. Um, you can, uh, when people stop breathing because of an opiate overdose, they're only not breathing and still alive for a very short period of time, right? If you stop breathing, your heart's going to follow very, very closely. So a lot of times we would have to use CPR and the AED as, long, as well as the naloxone, okay? So adult tachycardia with a pulse. All right, so um, why did I bring this back? Because usually I have a team full of students in a room, a mannequin, an AED, a bag valve mask, and an attitude, right? So I usually have people in, in my room with me, and we go through the um, algorithms, and I show um, my students strips, and we talk about what we can and cannot do. Um, what I want to remind you all on this slide is that if we have a wide complex QRS and it's a tachyarrhythmia wide complex QRS, we um, may give antiarrhythmic infusions because when you have a VTAC pulseless patient, that's the same medication we're also using as an antiarrhythmic. So if they're alive, we may give them amiodarone, but I want you to look at the dose on the side. If the person's alive in a, v, uh, in a ventricular tachycardia, we would give, instead of the 300 dose we give to people who are already, you know, we're doing compressions on, if they're still alive with a VTAC, we're going to cut that dose in half, and the first dose is 150 milligrams. So that's why I want to point that out to you. And we're back with, again, this is this is when in the class things get really, really fun. And we start pulling out the, the mannequin and, and calling for help and checking pulses. Um, that's why uh, I have the video that's posted with the mock code. And I would like you to watch that. So it doesn't replace being in person and having fun in the room in an area where we know we're not going to do any harm to our mannequin. But I want you to... to to look at this algorithm while you watch the video and pretend, take a pillow out for Pete's sake and, and do the compressions at the same time and think about how you would move and how you would communicate, all right? Nothing replaces a uh, simulated scenario. And if we're lucky enough to go to the sim lab, you may get a chance to practice this, okay? Here's our adult bradycardia with the pulse algorithm. So um, again, this in class, we'd be doing this on a dummy, but I want you to look at our medications. A lot of times um, with this, we're going to do medications first, right? So atropine. So make sure you know what a, a atropine dose is for an adult client, how often you can give it, and what the maximum dose is. And here's our acute coronary syndrome algorithm. If you are having trouble looking at a 12 lead, not a 12 lead, but looking at any EKG lead, and you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say ST elevation or ST depression, then I suggest you go and you, um, I'm going to be posting another video about this, and you watch that video because it talks about um, what the strips look like and so forth, okay? So if you have no idea what I'm talking about with ST elevation or ST depression, then I want you to look at that other video.